Welcome to Data Talk, Kathleen. We're so happy to have you. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing here at Experian? Yeah, hi, Destiny. Hi, Mike. It's great to be here. And I am looking after our innovation and strategy for decision analytics at Experian. Awesome. And I just want to jump right in and just talk about some of the trends in identification that we have going on now and just how you see the landscape of digital identity changing in your role. Yeah, absolutely. It's been quite a year, hasn't it? So I know everyone's looking forward to getting back into the office and Experian, of course, we're just on the cusp of that right now. Uh, but what a year it's been. And in 2020, there's been a lot of changes in terms of how we think about identity and that landscape and really that definition has changed a lot. If you think about the past year, I like to compare it to when we talk about traditionally, what does identity mean? And we think about PII, personally identifiable information. That's my name, my date of birth, address, maybe social security number, maybe even some credentials like where I have a diploma from or I have a license to practice in something. As we thought about last year, and especially as the whole world kind of locked down and we were forced to do everything from home, there was this shift change in what identity means and every aspect of our identity became digital. So not just the digitization of that PII and those things that I just listed, but all the things that make up us and our identity when we think about what we are online. It's, it's usernames, it's our email address, your mobile phone number, cookies, um, preferences that we've checked, websites that we've visited. All these things really comprise, if you think about it, the identity of me. And what I really noticed too is that as we think about that multidimensional definition of identity, I'm still me, but there is a dynamic aspect to it, isn't there? I've, I'm, I'm traveling around, my location, my IP address changes. I'm visiting different sites, my preferences change, I go through different life changes. And so while I'm always still me, I think in the digital world, we need to think about how our identity is actually dynamic and not static. And so all of these things are really fascinating when we think about how identity is changing, what that definition is, and what does it mean to be me online, offline. And last year certainly gave us a lot of opportunity to explore all those changes at a really rapid pace. Kathleen, um, I like the way you described our identities as being dynamic, like our habits change, the devices we use change, where we're going is changing. Um, what are some of the challenges that organizations are having when it comes to the dynamic nature of identities? Yes, um, it, it's a great point that you raise, Mike. And as organizations that we visit, whether those are places that we shop, banking, or you know, as we learned last year, even telemedicine, if I'm visiting my doctor with an online visit, it's really important for the business to engage and trust and authenticate me as I engage on those sites, you as we engage on those sites. But similarly, it's important for us as consumers to be able to trust the site that we're visiting and the business or the entity that we're transacting with. And so that identity verification, that authentication process, and the best way to do that has really made the core of the challenge. Because not only is there the task in recognizing each other and building that trust, it's also a very fertile landscape for fraudsters. Whenever you have that big disruption and change, um, uh, people joining in from different channels and through different mechanisms, there can be vulnerabilities there that those are the things fraudsters are looking for. They're looking for people who are not as familiar or comfortable. They're looking for scenarios where the business may not know you yet um, so that they can take advantage of that situation and uh, commit fraud. So for businesses, for entities, even for consumers, it's all about how do we have a trust relationship and a really great seamless online experience while also maintaining that security and that trust and preventing fraud. So that balance, getting that right, that's really where the trick is. 
Definitely, Kathleen. And just so our listeners can know, can you tell us about some of the different types of fraud, the popular types, so that we could all be aware? Sure, sure, absolutely. And so in the fraud space, we typically talk mainly about three different types of fraud. The one that's probably most familiar to folks with all the data breaches that have happened over the past several years is third party fraud. That's when a fraudster impersonates you or me. It's a stolen identity or a stolen credit card number uh, or some stolen login credentials. And a fraudster is impersonating you or me so that they can then transact and move some money or get some goods and services. So that's third party fraud. And there's a lot of tools that are out there to help determine whether the person is who they say they are. That's third party fraud. A great layered approach, different ways to do that. Another type of fraud is first party fraud. And that's when uh, the person who is going to perpetrate the fraud is who they say they are. It's actually really me. And I'm going to maybe um, uh, transact in a way so that I can get some goods and services, but maybe not ultimately pay for them. There's you know, first party fraud, maybe when someone orders something online then says it was never delivered and keeps the goods, for example. That is fraud. Um, it, there can also be fraud in terms of um, misrepresenting some of your credentials in order to be able to get a loan or to be able to get a credit card. And there's all sorts of reasons for this. Some of it is nefarious and some of it is just, you know, desperation. And we saw a lot of both in the last year. That's first party fraud. But it's something that uh, banks in particular, financial services companies need to contend with so they can determine what's really fraudulent behavior and distinguish that from just bad credit, frankly. And then the third type of fraud sort of falls somewhere in between. And that's synthetic identity fraud. And this one is really interesting. Synthetic identity fraud is where a fraudster takes several different pieces of information. So they may have a made up name a stolen social security number and a fictitious address. And they stitch these things together into what we almost call a Frankenstein ID because it's these mismatched parts. Um, but they create an identity which doesn't really belong to any person, right? It's a Frankenstein one. It's made out of these different parts, a synthetic ID. And then they will use that synthetic ID to try and um, get a loan or to be able to get some goods and services and then disappear. Uh, and so that, that's a really tricky one for us as an industry. Experian luckily has uh, fantastic capabilities in terms of analytics and data to help our clients address synthetic identity fraud. But it's a really vexing problem and one that has uh, promised to get even more interesting this year as you start to think about putting deep fake pictures or even videos with these in synthetic IDs to try and get past some of the security measures um, to validate whether it's a real person or not. I know, Mike, you've talked about this in previous uh, podcasts here as well. When you start to think about the combination and the lengths that fraudsters will go in order to try and perpetrate these frauds and create these IDs, um, it's, it's really something we need to be mindful of and, and help our clients to be prepared for um, going forward. Certainly. And thank you for going into detail about what types of fraud that consumers could be looking for. Can we just go a little bit in depth and just discuss what are the different products and services that Experian has to offer to protect consumers from identity theft and fraud? Yeah, absolutely. So Experian really is the Consumers Bureau. And there are a number of ways as consumers that we can be mindful about protecting our identity and really getting the best experiences when we engage online. One of the first things that we always recommend is good education. So understand uh, where your credit stands, understand how to engage with your banks, your other financial services providers, so that you can recognize when um, the bank is reaching out to you. The bank is never going to send you an email and ask you to please uh, click on this link and enter your password, right? So it's that kind of good education of knowing and, and helping those who are new to online engagement, you know, parents or other demographics, people who maybe weren't so familiar with how to engage online, but 
got thrust into that last year, educate them as to what kinds of messages and engagement are the safe ones and the appropriate ones. So that's the first one. We also recommend uh, credit monitoring services. These are fantastic capabilities that will allow us as consumers to be notified if a new account is trying to be opened uh, using our information or if some transactions don't quite look right. Um, and also even inform us if our information has been spotted on the dark web where fraudsters can purchase that and perpetrate other crimes. So it's that mixture of education, credit protection and monitoring, and just being really aware of what we do and what we see online. Kathleen, um, I love what Experian is doing to help protect consumers. And I'm curious about what are things that are that fraudsters are doing right now to try to keep ahead of you and Experian? Like, what are the things that they're working on? Yeah, I always like to say the fraudsters are very uh, motivated, organized uh, individuals. They they are motivated by the rewards that they're going to get from these frauds, and they're very innovative. And so it is up to us, and you know, I lead an innovation team to try and stay one step ahead of what's going on there. Really, the best approach is to have a layered approach, and we share this with our clients all the time. There is no silver bullet. There's no one fraud tool that you can just put in your system and you're going to stop all all of the crime. You need to have a layered approach so that you have the right tools to fight the right type of fraud at the right time. Because frankly, most of the transactions, over 90% of them are safe all the time. And so we wanna give those consumers the best path, the most convenience that they've come to expect, and then save those step ups, that friction, that other interference for what is likely a fraudulent transaction. Um, and so that is really trying to get that balance right, stay one step ahead. So some of the technologies that I really like are those that combine what I call passive authentication with active authentication. I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, passive authentication methods are things that in the background, as we're transacting, they gather information about how we're using our device or um, what type of device we're engaging with. It looks at um, very basic information on that device, such as settings, IP address, and see if that makes sense compared to what we're used to seeing or expect from that particular user. It's all in the background. It's non-PII, it's non-intrusive, but it's really looking for the difference of, is this a bot? Is this likely human? Is it Kathleen? Or is this potentially a fraudster? So there's great technologies there around the device, around behavioral analytics, things that we can layer in in the background. And then if something kind of triggers that this seems a little fishy, it might be fraud, then there's all different types of active ways that we can step up and figure out, you know, maybe let's see if this is really who we say they are. Um, we'll send a one-time password. We can ask knowledge-based authentication questions. Depending on the transaction, can even ask the user to present a government-issued ID. We can take a selfie to see if the picture matches that on the ID. Really layering those things in, the right ones at the right time, putting the data and the analytics behind that to do it in real time, that makes a great experience and helps us fight all of this new type of advanced fraud. Kathleen, as you were talking about the passive forms, I was just uh, reminded of a conversation I had with um, a high school principal and he was telling me about the steps they were taking to try to reduce fraud from students in test taking. Cause right now oh, wow. during re remote, right? Homeschool right. and also doing schoolwork, right. they're taking like statewide tests virtually. And so they're right. trying to, they're using software to help track like how mouse clicks, like, is this really mm -hmm. the student based on yes. previous behavior of their mouse and also how often they're clicking and how they click, how they type. Mm -hmm. Like that's yes. it's a very interesting way to kind of detect, is this really the person behind the screen? That's right. That's right, Mike. It's so fascinating. They say that those behaviors that we have, those usage patterns, and that's all behavioral analytics that you were describing, those are almost like a fingerprint, it turns out. Uh, how we use our mouse, maybe how we hold our device or engage. You know, one of the first things that that 
can really easily detect is, is this a bot or a human? That's actually very easy to detect um, uh, for these types of tools. But then is it the right kind of human behavior? Is it a student behavior? Is it someone who's applying for something? Um, it might be a human, but a human usually knows how to spell their name. They don't usually pause when they're typing their social security number, things like that. Uh, so those behaviors start to say, hmm, it, it's human, but it may not be quite what we're expecting here. It's a lot of advances in that area. I think it's a really exciting space. And you know what's really funny is um, I think about like in my situation, like I just broke my arm, right? So yes. I'm so used to typing <laughs> with two hands and now I'm using my left hand on my phone and I'm super slow. Like, <laughs> so I think about like if I was using any sort of software, fraud detection must be going crazy right now because like exactly. my thumb... <laughs> I can't really type very well with my left hand. I'm making spelling mistakes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They're wondering what's happened and maybe, you know, your very young child has stepped in yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, I think, and I think that's, the hard, that's the hard thing about like fraud detection because you're trying to verify the person, but there are like life situations that change. Like you're saying, the dynamic nature of how we use devices. Like I had an injury. Now I'm using a different device mostly. And yes. it's also not the same. I'm not using it the same way. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's why these things need the data and the analytics behind them. And this is one of the great, powerful things that Exper Experian can bring to bear. You know, as the Consumers Bureau, we just have a wealth of experience as well as the data and analytics that we have in-house and have had for decades that help us guide, engage, and kind of filter for most likely uh, events and most likely outcomes without throwing the system upside down when there's a natural change such as your broken arm, right? So that that is really an advantage that Experian has as well. And we're excited to be able to bring that capability to clients. Yes, Kathleen, I want to talk about facial recognition and touch ID being used as a primary yes. form of digital identification in this race and this journey to digital yeah. identification and how likely do you see it as our everyday use of identifying ourselves and how safe would that be as a form of identification yeah absolutely destiny and those are definitely physical biometric types of capture when we're talking about the behavioral usage patterns um, some in the industry call those behavioral biometrics. What you're talking about are really the physical biometrics. Our face, recognizing our, our fingerprints, sometimes even voice. There's voice print capability. Um, so all those physical biometrics are additional unique identifiers for identifying who we are. Like I said at the beginning, there is no silver bullet. We, we can't say, oh, I'm using face recognition, so now all fraud is going to stop. There are ways to to spoof that um, when there are very motivated fraudsters to do so. However, that being said, we've done a lot of polling and surveying. Every year, in fact, Experian does an annual global identity and fraud report. We survey businesses and individuals, uh, thousands of surveys returned, and then follow-on interviews to figure out what businesses and consumers feel about new technologies such as these? Do they like using them? Are businesses comfortable? Are they happy with the performance? When it comes to the biometrics, like you suggested, using my thumbprint, using my facial image, consumers really like that as a login type of approach. Um, and one of the reasons is, is because it does feel safe. There is cons a tremendous consumer trust globally in using those physical biometrics to verify oneself. And so they um, trust those mechanisms. We're happy using those. Uh, that's a phenomenon that I think has kind of grown over the last few years. It used to be uh, before we had the ubiquity of um, facial recognition on a lot of our smartphones, you know, not using it every day, it might feel a little creepy. Or why do I want to give my face to these, uh, you know, different entities that I'm working with? But now that we have seen the convenience and the security that that provides as one element of logging into a website or into an application, um, people have become more comfortable with that. And, my apologies. And it's a good element in terms of, our ability to authenticate 
an individual. So I do think that that's a, a good method. It's one that people trust, one that businesses trust. Um, and we're going to see how that continues to evolve as one of the key layers. There's some really interesting research going on in this space about facial recognition, um, how it's maybe used in uh, security applications. That's a completely different thing from the authentication that we're talking about. Um, but the technology still has ways to improve. Um, there's still bias built into these algorithms. And that's why, again, there's never a silver bullet here. It needs to be a, a layered approach. Kathleen, you just mentioned the Global Identity and Fraud Report, and I want to encourage everyone who's listening in to go and download that, just Google Experian Global Identity and Fraud Report. Um, are there any interesting insights you found in this last report from all the research you've done? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. It's, it's really exciting to be able to offer that to everyone. They can download that for free. Um, some of the insights that I found interesting were, and we did a little bit uniquely in 2020, because the pandemic seemed to be changing and disrupting things so quickly, instead of doing an all-in-one annual snapshot for the survey, this year we actually did three different surveys and watched the trending as the year went on to see how those sentiments maybe evolved. And what we found is that as the year progressed, uh, consumers' expectations for their engagement online and with various businesses increased. They expected to have great customer experiences. Um, they would uh, typically not wait more than 30 seconds online with a little spinning clock before abandoning whatever the transaction is. I feel that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so um, that sentiment was coming through. And so some 54% of consumers that we surveyed said that their expectations had elevated in terms of what they were expecting from uh, businesses. Um, and only 31% of consumers felt that businesses were hitting the mark. So what that told me was that we as an industry have a lot of room here to meet the needs of the consumer, to understand that they've become more educated and more sophisticated that we have an opinion and we want to be recognized and trusted and we want to be able to transact in a way that we also feel is secure. So very interesting statistics there, very consumer centric in how we think about uh, going forward. And this year is all about back to growth. Businesses are ready to come out of the pandemic. The economy, especially here in the U.S., is on the upswing. And so consumers' expectations are going to be high, and this is, this is our opportunity and our challenge to meet those. It's so funny when you're talking about the report results, because I think about how impatient I can be now. Like if it's spinning 15 seconds, that could be like an hour. <laughs> I'm like, really? 15 seconds? Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Our patience for this has just gone out the door. We're all tired of waiting. We're tired of being cooped up, you know, so I think it all goes hand in hand. And I'm, and I'm curious, I'm curious, Kathleen, because like, because you are tracking this, you're working in this space, you're, you're working on preventing fraud from happening online. As you personally, like kind of navigate and are searching online and like thinking about buying something, I'm curious about like red flags for you when you're on websites or thinking about buying something. Like personally, as you were looking at a website and thinking about whether you're going to buy something there, red flags you have about those forms. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always looking for, is the information being asked necessary for this transaction? And a lot of times there'll be a form there and it will highlight those fields which are required for us to fill in. There's no need to fill in the things that aren't required uh, unless it's just an entity that you love because they're probably going to use that for targeting some offers to you, etc., which is great. But uh, depending on whether you know and trust that entity, you don't need to fill in the things that aren't required. And then look for secure ways of payment. Um, I really like that there are a lot of options now for us. We can use uh, digital wallet mechanisms like PayPal or Apple Pay or, or Zelle, even in some cases, and Venmo. Um, there are ways that we can pay and transact peer-to-peer -peer or with businesses that are very secure and add levels of encryption there. Um, and then just also keeping an eye on your credit card transactions. Um, the identity theft is still out there. Credit card number theft is still out there. 
And so I'm always watching to see what are my options there. And I tend to try to use, for example, one credit card for everything that I buy on Amazon and a different credit card for when I'm in person transacting at the grocery store and the like. It makes it a little bit easier for me to notice a transaction that might have kind of gone awry. Right. So those are the kinds of things oh, that I, I do that. that I'm always looking for. That's I really that. good. That's really that's very smart. I'm definitely going to be following that advice. And yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I do have a question for you, Kathleen. So whenever we talk about the dark web, and I know that Experian has like protections for consumers and just notifications that consumers can get if their information is, you know, on that. Um, can you can we talk about exactly what that is and and how how people's information gets on there and just how Experian is is helping protect consumers there? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a number of ways, and I I can't pretend to know all of them, um, but you know, everyone's systems are vulnerable, and in fact, a lot of the online third-party impersonation fraud occurs when credentials are learned um, through social engineering. And uh, this can be from these phone calls that we all get, these robocalls and these spam phone calls that we get. And there's you know certain populations that are especially vulnerable to those. This is your bank calling. I need to check things for you. Can you just log into your computer and I'll send you a text message and, I'll send, and just click here. Um, and uh, people will fall victim of that and their credentials will be harvested. Uh, anytime we click on an email that doesn't that looks suspicious or even doesn't look suspicious, right? They look great nowadays. Once fraudsters have your credentials, they can go in the front door. It doesn't matter how many firewalls and everything are in place from the business. If they have your name and login credentials, they can just go straight in. So it's really being mindful of um, not inadvertently supplying that information. Don't click on those spam messages that we're getting to our phones now and to our email. Be very, very vigilant about that. But even even with our best behavior, uh, things can get stolen. And, and it, it happens. It's happened to me. Anywhere that we transact with, especially um, credit card systems, whether it's online or point of sale, those businesses are vulnerable. And uh, fraudsters have been able to break in through various means and harvest big lists of people's names and credit card information or additional information. When they have those vast lists, they either put them for sale on the dark web or they start to do um, a concentrated attack where they're trying um, those credentials at various vendors. It's interesting, and I guess I should make a plug, please use different passwords for different sites and things that you log into. When fraudsters uh, steal your name and email address with a password from maybe a less protected site, they're going to bet that a number of you are reusing your passwords over and over and over again, and they're just going to try it on everything. And uh, so they, they call that credential stuffing. So to protect yourself from that, I know it can be painful. Use a password manager, but try to do a different password on the different places that you engage with. So information gets there. It, um, it's inevitable. It's going to continue to happen. Some of it's within our control to try and prevent, but a lot of it's out of our control. And the best that you can do is to be aware, be educated, and, and be smart as you can in how you transact. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That's going to be so helpful for so many people. And I just want to thank you. And we're wrapping up at our time. And I just want to know if there's anything else you think that our consumers should know about what Experian is doing in identity and fraud. Yeah, I just would love to leave you with kind of a, a good news story and a feel-good story with the year that we've had. I'm really proud to be a part of Experian because of the ways that we're able to help consumers and businesses um, to have the best opportunities that they can and really empower um, uh, the things that we all want to do and transact in our lives. And um, last year, as the pandemic hit, tens of millions of Americans found themselves out of work. And that sent all kinds of ripples through our lives and through the economy. Uh, a number of folks then, these people had to apply for unemployment benefits. 
And a very sad story is that fraudsters saw that as a fantastic opportunity with the stimulus, with increased benefits for unemployment. Uh, they saw the chance of a lifetime in terms of money that they could go after. And so a lot of our state workforce agencies who process these unemployment claims found themselves overwhelmed. So many people unemployed needing benefits, their own employees now working from home and trying to cope with that, uh, as, as well as just this onslaught of fraud. And it was a really scary situation for a lot of folks and when we really needed those benefits the most. And what Experian was able to do is in working with the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, NASWA, um, we were able to provide fraud analytics to help those agencies better cope with the volumes, as well as being able to better detect what were the good applicants from fraudulent applicants. Um, it's been quite a process. There's been billions of dollars lost to fraud in this space. And it's not only hurting taxpayers, but it's slowing down the benefits to the people who have really needed it. So I'm really proud to say that as of today, we are working with NASWA. We are um, providing these fraud analytics capabilities in 31 states to improve this process and really stop the bad guys and, and help get the benefits to those who need it most. We're able to do that because of experience analytics and data and just our commitment to, to the well-being and powering opportunities for individuals. So I'm really proud to be a part of that and um, glad to be making a difference going forward. That is such an awesome story. I love that. That is so cool. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Absolutely. It's great to be here. Thank you both. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Data Talk podcast. We share new shows every week, and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes, including YouTube videos, on our Experian News blog. You can get access to the full catalog by going to experian.com slash datatalk. And we always love hearing from our community, so if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows or guests you'd like to hear from, please let us know. You can leave a comment on iTunes, or you can reach out to us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab. You can also email me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care and we'll chat next week.